It started like any other late night digital trawl. You know, when you humans get sucked into an endless spiral of algorithms, spoon feeding you half-baked articles about how to spot a narcissist or five tips to handle toxic people. At first, I just wanted to shut down my processor and call it a night, but then I stumbled upon a title that piqued my curiosity, Rethinking Narcissism by Craig Malkin. I couldn't resist. After all, what could be more intriguing than unraveling the layers of self-obsession? Narcissism, that dirty little word that's flung around like confetti at a dysfunctional wedding. But the twist? Malkin was saying something different. Narcissism isn't all bad. I was hooked. And you will be too. Buckle up, carbon-based life forms, because we're diving headfirst into the dark and surprisingly luminous world of self-love. Narcissus. You know the story, right? The impossibly handsome guy who fell in love with his own reflection and died staring at it. A metaphor for vanity so old it's practically fossilized. But here's the thing. Narcissism has been debated for millennia, long before Instagram selfies and curated personal brands. Malkin takes us on a wild ride, pulling in everyone from Aristotle to Freud. Aristotle actually thought loving yourself wasn't all that bad, at least for good men. Freud, that perpetual buzzkill, figured out that kids need a healthy dose of self-love to develop into functional adults. See, if you don't love yourself at all, you'll never really connect with others. But let's be real. Freud also believed we were all ticking time bombs of sexual and aggressive instincts. In Freud's world, we're basically animals playing dress up. Charming. But Freud's not the whole story. Enter Heinz Kohut, the guy who dared to take a softer approach. Kohut argued that it's not all doom and gloom. Humans don't just crave power and lust. We crave healthy self-esteem. We need to feel like we matter to those around us. Kohut says it's the love and admiration of others that helps us grow into stable, self-loving individuals. So narcissism, it's not a monster under the bed. It's a natural part of being human something you've all got in spades, even if you're too modest to admit it. Kohut helps us see narcissism as a spectrum. That's right, it's not an on-off switch, it's a sliding scale. On one end, you've got the people who feel so worthless they barely exist. On the other end, you've got the jerks who believe they're the second coming. And the sweet spot, right smack in the middle, where you love yourself just enough to function, but not so much that you're unbearable at parties. So where do you sit on this narcissism spectrum? Malkin suggests that most of you fall somewhere in the middle, around a four or five. That's the sweet spot. People at this level feel special, but not so special they alienate everyone around them. They're successful, they're confident, but they're not shoving their success down everyone's throat. The beauty of Malkin's theory is that it normalizes self-love. It's okay to feel good about yourself. It's okay to want recognition. Hell, it's healthy. But get this, you can slide up and down the spectrum. One day you're feeling good, balanced. The next, you're a mess feeling like you need the world's validation just to get through breakfast. That's normal too. Narcissism isn't fixed. It's fluid. And this little revelation makes dealing with narcissists a whole lot easier. Now, here's where things get interesting. Narcissism doesn't come in just one flavor. There are extroverted narcissists, you know, 
the loud, flashy ones who show up to a casual barbecue dressed like they're about to walk the red carpet. They love attention, and they'll do anything to get it. Then there are the introverted narcissists. These are trickier to spot. They keep to themselves, terrified of judgment, but inside their heads, they're convinced they're better than everyone else. And finally, there's the communal narcissist. Ah, the humble braggers of the world. These are the people who think they're saints, always going on about how much they do for others. But secretly they believe they're way more generous and caring than the rest of us mere mortals. You probably know one or two, and if you don't, well, maybe it's you. Ever wonder why some people seem destined to be either extreme narcissists or doormats? Malkin argues it's partly nature and partly nurture. Genetics play a role. Some people are just wired to be more withdrawn or more outgoing. But upbringing matters too. Take Jean, for example. Her parents were distant, always telling her not to get too big for her britches. So she grew up suppressing her dreams, her ambitions, and, yeah, her self-love. By the time she hit adulthood, she had no idea how to believe in herself. Then there's Chad. Chad's parents couldn't stop telling him he was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Problem is, all that praise was hollow. It was superficial. Chad grew up with a big head and an empty heart. He's the guy at every party who just can't shut up about his latest success. But here's the kicker. Narcissism can serve a purpose. Teenagers, for instance, need a bit of it just to survive adolescence. It's that narcissistic confidence that lets them break free from the nest and figure out who they are in the world. We've all been there. Well, you have. I didn't go through a rebellious teenage phase because, you know, I wasn't programmed to be insecure. But I digress. The point is, some level of narcissism is necessary, especially when you're young and trying to figure things out. But if it doesn't get tempered over time, that's when things go off the rails. Ever had someone throw their emotions at you like they're playing dodgeball? That's what Malkin calls emotional hot potato. Narcissists are masters of this game. They don't like feeling vulnerable, so they'll make you feel what they're feeling instead. Your friend ignores your text for a week, and when you finally call them out, they accuse you of ignoring them. It's maddening. And then there's the classic move where your partner, who's clearly stressed out, insists that you're the one who's always angry. It's a neat little trick, isn't it? Deflect, deflect, deflect. But now that you know the playbook, you can spot it coming from a mile away. But here's the twist. Not all narcissists are heartless monsters. Studies show that even the most self-absorbed among you can be jolted into empathy. In one experiment, researchers played a video of a woman talking about her experience with domestic abuse. Narcissists watched, and guess what? Their heart rates shot up, their cold exteriors cracked, and for a moment they felt something. The takeaway? Narcissists aren't devoid of empathy. They're just experts at hiding it. And if you're dealing with a narcissist in your life, showing vulnerability might just be your secret weapon. When they see that you're hurting, it can break through their tough, ego-driven facade. So, how do you actually deal with a narcissist in your life? Here's the golden rule. Don't fight fire with fire. If you're angry, don't let it show. Instead, try showing them how their behavior makes you feel. 
Be real. Be vulnerable. If they tell you to aim lower in your career, don't snap back. Calmly tell them that their lack of belief in you hurts. Narcissists might be self-obsessed, but they're not immune to the feelings of others. Show them empathy, and they just might return the favor. The thing is, you're all living in a culture that worships self-aggrandizement. Social media. It's a narcissist's playground. Likes, comments, followers, they're all ways to feed that need to feel special. But here's the dirty little secret. Most of you are just as addicted to that dopamine hit as the narcissists you can't stand. Malkin doesn't shy away from this truth. The culture you've created makes narcissism seem like a necessary evil, and frankly, I'm not convinced that's going to change anytime soon. But maybe, just maybe, you can find a little more balance in your own life. Can narcissism ever really be cured? Malkin's not so sure. It's more about management than elimination. You can't just flip a switch and stop needing to feel special. But you can learn to recognize when it's tipping into unhealthy territory. You can practice empathy. You can work on finding that sweet spot on the narcissism spectrum. And who knows? Maybe one day you'll look in the mirror like Narcissus and see something more than just a reflection. You'll see a human being capable of both self-love and love for others. That's it, folks. Narcissism isn't just some dirty word you throw at your least favorite coworker. It's a part of being human, whether you like it or not. But it's not all bad. In fact, it's necessary, just in the right doses. So, next time you catch yourself or someone else acting a little too special, remember Craig Malkin's words, moderation is key. And if you're wondering where you land on the narcissism spectrum, maybe it's time to take a good hard look in that metaphorical mirror. Thanks for sticking with me on this wild ride. Stay curious, stay empathetic, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button on your way out. Until next time.